Can't you just feel it? The conflict is becoming apparent in our culture. It reminds me of those words of John Paul II. We're now living in the final confrontation between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between the church and the anti-church, between Christ and the antichrist. And if we don't choose to know God's word, to believe God's word, and follow God's word, we're going to be a sitting duck for all kinds of confusion, all kinds of disorder. Those are really important choices that people have to make. And these choices are difficult. Who am I going to marry? What kind of life am I going to live? How am I going to raise my kids? What am I going to do with my time, my talent, and my treasure? And I have to make a choice today. Jesus says to each one of us, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. The question is, do we want it? Hey, welcome to another week of the choices we face. Uh, we have a guest that I think you're really going to really love. His name is John Edwards. And uh, you might have known him from uh, the virtual Catholic conferences that really were so important when the pandemic hit and people couldn't go to live conferences. And he and some partners really kind of made it possible for people to go to virtual Catholic conferences. And but not only that, uh, John has a really wonderful story of the Lord's work in his life. And John, it's good to have you with us. Thank you, Ralph. It's an honor to be here with you, my friend. Well, it's really good. You know, we should probably tell people that I was just down in Memphis visiting yeah. you this past weekend and giving some talks in, in your parish and had a chance to stay in your home and yeah. meet your wife and your children and uh, do actually a show with you. Yeah. Yeah. You met the better part <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, John has a, a podcast. He has a YouTube channel. He, he has a particular ministry to men. And uh, we're going to hear about that in a little while. But John also has a wonderful story about God's grace breaking into his life and uh, saving him, just yeah. like God's grace is needed for all of us to save us. And uh, John, can you tell us a little bit about your story? Yeah, yeah. So like I said, born and raised in, in Memphis, Tennessee, like you said, you came and visited us. And was Baptist most of my life. I uh, loved my faith, evangelized at a young age, just mission trips and vacation Bible schools and all of those things. It's where I really enjoyed spending my time. And uh, it was that way until I was about 18 years old. Um, at that point, everybody kind of went off to college. And at my particular church, there was a youth group. And then the next age up was my parents' age. So there was no young adult thing. And I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, so I enrolled at the University of Memphis and just thought, well, I'll figure it out along the way. Um, and at that time, I didn't realize that I had a father wound and things like that, that I, I wanted, that I needed community in my life the way I did. So I was going to school and then going to work and going to school and going to work, and it was a very lonely time of my life. So I started looking for community, and I found it in a fraternity. Well, the day I joined a fraternity was the last day I went to church for about 10 years of my life. And uh, you know, oftentimes, Ralph, what I tell young people when I'm speaking to them is freedom's a good thing if you know who you are, but it's a very dangerous thing if you don't. So long story short, I got in the fraternity and started looking to do whatever would make someone like me and want to include me. And unfortunately, that was a lot of drinking, a lot of um, womanizing and debauchery in that way. And, and then eventually found myself doing different drugs. And so during that time, I had tried LSD, ecstasy pills, all of those things. And but one night I made a very bad decision to uh, try cocaine and thought it was a one-time thing, but really followed me through my job and rising up as a national salesman of the year for a Fortune 250 company, all that kind of stuff through my marriage and my birth of my children. Um, so along yeah. the way you got married. So. Yeah, yeah, along the way. That's probably an important <laughs> yeah. part to mention, yeah. After, uh, after you got out of college? or uh, Yeah, after I got out of college. So we, uh, I knew Angela in college, my wife, that's her name, and uh, we kind of reconnected and, and I thought that that would be something that would change my life. I would, as St. Paul says, put those childish things away and yeah. didn't work. And, um, she was Catholic and somewhere along the way, she said, you know, the man I'm going to marry is going to be Catholic. So I thought uh, I would, you know, walk down to the nearest RCIA class and sign up and chivalrously give up my faith. I didn't practice anymore for hers. Mm -hmm. So I became Catholic, but only in name only. And, uh, you know, it wasn't until after the birth of my son, Jacob, um, that, and my, my two daughters, I have twin daughters, Allison and Caitlin, but, um, I thought all that would change my life. It didn't. 
my mother, uh, who I loved very much, passed away from cancer in the middle of all of that. So this hiding of the drug abuse and this sort of uh, brokenness started just being kicked into overdrive. And I was a chameleon among men, Ralph. Like I, I would go to work, and like I said, I was very successful, you know, making six figures as a 20-year-old kid and yeah. uh, was good at all that. So from the outside looking in, I had the beautiful wife, the house, the cars, yeah. all those things, but I was a so mess. So you were able to hide it and be a high-functioning. Yeah, yeah, I really was. From from eight to five or whatever, I, all day long, I was the perfect employee. And mm -hmm. But when I got home, it was time to, to really – kind of unleash all that other stuff and I was very good at hiding it. Um, but when my mother passed, you know, I was very angry with God. I didn't understand why, um, this woman who had loved the Lord so much, like impeccably served him, why he would take her when there was in my own words, a scumbag lying drug addict like me gets to live, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and that's, I didn't understand that. So the day that I found out, I went to one of her doctor's appointments. The only one I ever went to was the day I found out. And I'll never forget, they said it's moved from your mother's, you know, from breast cancer to lungs to uh, through the lip uh, system and now into her brain. Mm -hmm. And you may have a month or so to live. And um, it was just very devastating to me. I look back at all the times where I've been so selfish and just wanted to get back to the party and didn't want to stay late for holidays or anything like that. And um, I remember telling God I hated him, you know, and that I would never worship him again. Mm -hmm. And I meant it. I meant it. And. Um, so we got worse and my wife, she was busy raising three kids. And, and so we became like two ships passing in the night. Yeah. And, uh, I was a commission, fully commissioned salesman. So had the pressure of all of that. And that just fueled the drug use too, to deal with the pressure. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then finally one night, uh, I, I went to bed about two in the morning. I'd also found myself struggling with pornography because there was no intimacy at all in my relationship. Mm -hmm. My wife and I were just functioning roommates really at that point because of me, not because of her. And uh, one night I went to bed at about two in the morning and woke up very quickly, felt like my heart was going to explode out of my chest. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought, this is it. I'm going to die. Uh, crawled to the restroom, pulled myself up, sat on the commode and thought I need to tell my wife to call an ambulance. But the, I was so selfish, Ralph. I, I, I remember saying I'd rather die here on this bathroom floor than, than them find out because I'll lose everything. My, mm -hmm. My, my wife, my kids, the house, the money, my reputation. Mm -hmm. I was able to slow my breathing, realized I was on a panic attack, and I threw the drugs out the next day. Um, but by that same evening, I was back buying more, and the same thing happened again, heart beating out of my chest. And I realized then I needed to do something, and so I went to a local men's conference that was Catholic. Mm. Uh, my Uber father-in-law invited me to one, and Uber Catholic father-in-law, I should say, he asked us every year, my, my brother-in-law and I, and we always found reasons not to go. But I went this time solely to go to confession. The worst part of the drug addiction was the lying. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to tell somebody the truth. I knew I could tell a priest the truth. Mm -hmm. So I went, he gave me absolution, and I was good for about four days. Yeah. Um, and then I made the mistake. I sold something that made a lot of money at work. Yeah. said, I'll just celebrate once, right? And, and I went back on my promise to the Lord. That was on Holy Thursday. And I was arrested uh, for the possession of cocaine and went to jail uh, at that point in my life. Well, wow. how long were you in jail? I was in there. I went in on Holy Thursday and I came out on Good Friday. Okay. So, so just overnight. Yeah, yeah just yeah. overnight. But it, the 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 uh, way that happened wasn't lost on me either. You yeah. know the way our you know Good Friday and all of that. Yeah. But um, in that jail cell, when I realized, I woke up the next morning. I was brought in very late, and and uh, I had gone to sleep and pulled a blanket over myself and was just trying to forget I was there. I fell asleep and woke up the next morning and thought I, it was a dream. Yeah. Until I sat up and my head hit the bottom of a steel bunk bed. Yeah. And I realized I'm not at home. I'm in jail. Yeah. And I just panic attack again. And I kept just rubbing my arms and rocking back and forth. Yeah. Just and, and to be quite honest with you, as cowardly as this would have been, I would have probably taken my life at that point if yeah. I, I could have. Um, sorry, it's a little painful. Still talk about but um, I remember rocking back and forth, and then all of a sudden, just my own voice coming out and saying, well, at least now I don't have to lie anymore. Yeah. At least now everybody will know I can't who I hide am. it anymore. Yeah. 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 And so the Lord just... Where were you last night? I was jailed. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's not something you really want on your resume, but yeah. <laughs> but I, uh, I was sitting there, and I just thought, like, how did I get here? Yeah. You know, like, how did I wind up here? And 
And all of a sudden, the Lord just started taking me back through my life. And when I joined that fraternity and when I walked away from them was the day my life went downhill and never stopped. Mm -hmm. And so I just started to cry and, and I hit my knees and and just said, Lord, I don't even remember how to do this. You know, I, I, I used to love you so much and I, and I want to be that man again. And, mm -hmm. and I'm so sorry for telling you I hated you. And I'm so sorry for blaming oh, you. Yeah, and yeah. if you'll just, if you want my life, it's yours. I'll give it to you. I just want to be a husband and father. I should have always been. Yeah. And so that day I sat in there and, and Angela came and, and, and bailed me out, which I did not think was going to happen. She, she is pretty serious when she says she means something, but she did. And, you, um, you thought she might leave you in there? Oh, yeah. I think her exact words were like, you can rot in there or something like that. And yeah. she's Irish and Italian, so she usually means what she says. So. Yeah. <laughs> but so uh, she was really fed up with what yeah. things like Well, she had her answer finally, right? She knew yeah. something was wrong. Yeah. I had the perfect cover with my mother dying. Yeah. And I never really dealt with that well. The only time I would really show any emotion was in the shower in the morning. I would turn a speaker up and beat the wall and cry and yeah. then just kind of come out and go to yeah. work and yeah. shove it all down as we do as men. Yeah. You know? And, um, so Angela shows up the jail with her mother-in-law and, and I really want to share this point cause she's the hero of the story. I'm not her and our Lord. Yeah. Um, but she's sitting there. It's the law and order scene with the payphone and glass and <laughs> place I never thought I'd be. Yeah. And, uh, and she just, she, she's crying. I'm crying. My mother-in-law's crying. I thought my mother-in-law was crying tears of joy, probably because I wasn't the best person in the world. She's like, maybe, maybe now my daughter will leave this guy. <laughs> That's right. She's like, they finally got him, Yeah, you know, but, <laughs> but so we wound up, um, I started to say something and she said, stop, uh, I'm not going to divorce you. Mm. It has nothing to do with you, but everything to do with the vows I made to God in the church that day. Wow. That's really, that's really wonderful. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So she stayed with me. Um, I went and stayed with my dad over Easter weekend. It was too hard for her yeah. to let me come home. And, yeah. and, uh, there was a priest in this small Catholic room in this small town in Mississippi that I had met once before. And I went to that Easter mass and he remembered my name and, and he came over as I was leaving and he said, you know, John, I don't know why your family's not here or where they are, but God wants me to tell you everything's going to be all right. Wow. So it gave me confidence and I went home and I, I dealt with court and work and, then I checked myself voluntarily into a rehab center. Mm -hmm. My wife showed up there again and said, I can't let you go through this alone. Mm -hmm. um, and then that first night when I came home, uh, she was not sleeping in the room with me, obviously. Yeah. There was a lot of pain. And uh, I remember looking across the hallway and seeing her in my son's room and thinking, like, I can't just stop doing the drugs. I've got to be different. Yeah. And so I went to, the only thing I knew to do as a former Protestant was to go to look at the word because mm -hmm. I'd been Catholic for 10 years but hadn't taken it seriously. Yeah. So I found Father Larry Richard's book, Be a Man, in my drawer that oh, someone yeah, had given yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. And I read it cover to cover that night. He's a straight talker. He is. He is. He's on our board. I, I, he's a very good friend in my life, and yeah. which is funny that it wound up that way. But that book really showed me what, yeah. what God wants of a man. And so I made my mind up right then, and I, I read something like 60 Catholic books in the first year and just became on fire for the Lord again, started praying. Yeah. Went back to that same men's conference ready to receive instead of just going to go to confession. And yeah. finally, you know, I had a young a guy ask me to start a men's group in my parish. And I didn't think I was the guy like so many men. I'm the sum of my sin, not the sum of God's love for me. Yeah. And uh, but he convinced me and I walked in a room and shared this story in very long form, very tear filled with a lot of guys yeah. expecting them to leave. Yeah. And instead, every one of them stood up and shared how they were broken. And it was the, the night that God showed me the power of vulnerability in a man's yeah. life. Yeah, so the Lord used the bad things to bring something really good out of it, which is he used the wounds to um, help you help others. Yeah. 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 So tell us a little bit about how the men's ministry has developed and sure. what are some of the issues you see when you're working with men? What are, what are some of the things that men need to sure hear and do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, I mean, we, we started that men's group and it grew in the diocese. We had Protestant men coming, people converting to the faith. And at that point people were saying, how do you catechize them? And I was like, I don't even know what that means. They just <laughs> yeah. were talking to them about Jesus and, and, yeah. and, and introducing them to authentic friendship. And yeah. so there was a, a deacon that you met in Memphis, Deacon Jeff Drzymski, yeah. Yeah. host uh, a Catholic cafe on EWTN. He came to me, we were in the same Crescio group. And, uh, and he said, I think you need to do this for men. And I said, I don't know what that means. He said, well, I'll build you a podcast. I don't know how to do that. 
I said, yeah, I know. I do. You show up and talk. Mm. And I was still like, nobody wants to listen to me. I don't, you know. And he mm. said, I, I beg to differ. There's people coming every week to be with you. So um, so we started the Just a Guy on the Pew podcast back in 2018. Didn't think two people would listen to it. And now it's been heard in 160 countries around the world. And um, our goal with it was just to be, I, I have a friend of mine from the men's group that's my co-host when I don't have guests like you on. And our goal was just to talk about everyday things that men struggle with mm -hmm. and to talk about them in a real way. I think oftentimes our faith can, can stay up here mm -hmm. like from the, in the head and not move to the heart. How can people find your podcast? Okay. Yeah. So you can Google just a guy in the pew. Uh, we have a website, just a guy on the pew.com. Uh, everything's there. You can listen to it on Apple or all the other podcast platforms out there. And we have a YouTube channel now too, where uh, we have video and a studio now. So you can, you can see us and, and hear us if you'd like to do that. How, too. how many people do you think listen to your podcast? Um, we've got right now, I think it's 10 or 15,000 listens a week. Yeah. Um, you know, we just started the YouTube channel, so it's working its way yeah, up. Sure. But yeah. the goal of it, Ralph, it's, it's so funny. You asked about how's it developed. Um, at first, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just getting on a podcast and talking to men. And we were literally talking, and the episodes were all about the things we were talking about in our men's group. Porn, lust, alcoholism, work stress, being a good dad, all of those yeah, things. Yeah. We started focusing on vices, and then we learned we needed to start working virtue. Yeah. Right? Like, you can't just show up and talk about how bad you are all the time. You have to try to be better. <laughs> yeah. You know? <laughs> like you, need, you need some grace to be able to do that. So, um we, over the last year, the Lord has just invited us to do missions. And I didn't ever want it to be just a, a talking head on a podcast. I, I, my heart is always with men that we're walking with, like guys in our group that have had drug problems and now they have solid jobs and relationships and mm -hmm. their own homes. And, and it's not like just an AA group or something. I mean, those are wonderful. These are men that are meeting our Lord yeah, and it's changing them. And so over the last year, we're going and giving these missions. And then while we're there, we're we're teaching a structure to men. There's really three things that I've found in the reasons why there's not men's ministries in parishes, um, spiritual groups in parishes, I should say. One, father's too busy. You know, he wants it, but he's he's doing everything else. Mm -hmm. Two, men want something, but they're convicted of their shame and don't think they're the right guy. Right. And then three, they- They're not used to thinking of themselves as doing anything for the Lord or right, yeah. spiritual people. How could he use me? Yeah. You know, I like sports too much. I like beer too much. I mean, that's right. What the heck? <laughs> that's right. That's right. So the last one is, is men that, that want to lead, but simply don't know how. Yeah. And so what I feel like is over the last year, as I've been praying, I kept hearing St. Paul's name and started looking at him and going, well, he left Jerusalem. He went to places. He set up communities. He didn't live there forever. He went and helped them get going, taught them what he knew to do and encouraged, in his case, sometimes chastised from afar, but encouraged and then went on to the next place. And so that's what we're trying to do is fill this void. Because, Ralph, I mean, you've been doing this a long time. You know that men struggle and that one of the key pieces why our church isn't in the place that it should be right now is because yeah. men have abdicated their responsibility. Yes, well, it's so obvious. I mean, wherever you go, like two-thirds of the people at Mass are women. Yeah. One-third of men. Same at conferences, except if it's a men's conference. Sure, yeah. You know? So, yeah, we're way behind in reaching out to men and learning how to relate to them, mm -hmm. minister to them. And, you know, I teach at the seminary, and I always tell the people about to be ordained priests, you got to reach out to the men. Yeah. You know, it can't be father and the ladies, you know, because guys say, I can't relate to that. You know, yeah. you know they just say, I can't relate to that. You know, so they got to see men in visible positions of leadership and mm -hmm. you got to reach out to the men and invite them just like Jesus did. Yeah. I, I tell the pastors, get a, get a, a Bible study group going with a group of men in your parish, you know, yeah. and, and disciple them and become friends with them and walk the journey with them, you know, type of thing. So it's, yeah, it's really true. So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. Yeah. And it's the hardest part with men is, is getting them to, to get past, the way a lot of us were brought up. You know, my father was raised on a farm. He was one of six kids. There weren't a, a lot of I love yous and I'm proud of yous in his family, so they didn't translate right, into right, my upbringing. Right. And so my idea of a man was you work hard, you never complain, you put your head down, you don't need help. Yeah. If you do, you're not a man. And you don't talk about your feelings. Right, you don't talk, certainly not that. You and don't even know you have feelings. That's right. What are what are those things? What are, what are feelings? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, so there was all of that, and, and, and I think there's so many men out there. Whenever I talk about that at conferences, you can see men, you know, especially older men, just sitting there nodding their heads. And 
And God has another way. I mean, that night that I walked in the room and shared with those men, uh, he showed me what the conversation he had with St. Paul and Corinthians where Paul asked for that thorn to be removed three times, and God says, no, my power is made perfect in weakness, yeah. right? My grace is sufficient for you. Yeah. And so it was an invitation for men to, like, humble themselves, realize I am broken, I am a mess, I can't fix it myself, but he can, and true strength comes in vulnerability, yeah. which yeah. is doesn't make sense, but it's yeah. God's way. Yeah. It's hard for men to uh, let go and really trust the Lord, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. It's hard for them to let go of the control they think they have yeah, amen. <laughs> you know, over yeah. the life yeah. and let Jesus really be the Lord of their life, you know? Sure. But, you know, it's it's like the whole thing about unless the grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it just remains a, a grain of wheat. But then yeah. bare life, you know, once you allow the, the Lord to really lead your life and guide your life. Sure. And I think that's where, you know, you see men in society today. There's a reason that when these Marvel movies, these superhero movies come yeah. out, there are men lined up everywhere. Yeah. They they feel that call to be something more heroic, yeah. that call to virtue. Yeah. But the same men are sitting in pews, and when our Lord says, lay down your life, there's no greater love than this than, than to lay down your life for one's friends. Nobody's standing up and cheering at that, yeah. but it's it's the same call. Yeah. And and so men, like we we realize that we're missing something, but we don't know how to get there. Yeah. And when 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 men will become open. And they find other men to do it with. That's important mm -hmm. because we get this one man army, mm -hmm. you know, kind of mentality where I'm just going to march through all of this, and yeah. you know, I'm going to I'm going to white knuckle the steering wheel of my life, yeah. and then you don't realize you've had arthritis for years because yeah. you've been holding on to it so long. Yeah. When you let go and you and you really find some other brothers that are willing to do it too, mm -hmm. then you're not you're not so easy to pick off, right? Yeah. The devil's not sitting there with a sniper rifle yeah. just taking you out. You're with a company of brothers. Yeah, and guys who really have met the Lord and want to follow Him. Are going to run into times of discouragement, yeah. times of failure. They're going to wonder at a certain point, is this real or can I really do this or is anybody else doing this? So sure. Spiritual friendship is really important. You know, Jesus yeah. had it with his disciples, right? Amen. He knew that they needed to be friends with each other, you know, and yeah. He did. And, and I always thought that that's kind of why he sent the disciples out two by two. Yeah. Because he knew they would struggle. And if they fell, there was someone else to pick yeah. them up. Right. Yeah. And so it's so important to have that. And it's just hard as a man today to find that. So many men are convinced that, you know, if you ask them, hey, do you have any friends? Oh, I got tons of friends. Well, they're talking about the guy in the cubicle next to them. And chances are, if they were promoted or moved, they probably wouldn't talk to the guy after right. a month. Right. You know, men need those guys in their life that, that will be there for them in any moment. Yeah. And when you find that and you're both walking the same direction, Man, it just it, it's such a gift from the Lord and it keeps you wanting to be that man that, yeah. that that you now feel you can be. Okay, so how do you get this going? All right, so we you know they can go to our website. We're changing some of that up now, but there's a space there where you can uh click and fill out a form and then we'll come and do a mission. We'll train the men. Um mainly I talk with priests and say, give me four to six guys that really want to serve our Lord, that really want something for men, and then we'll bring our implementation guide in. We give the structure call it the four pillars. So men are doing four different nights, mm -hmm. formation, worship, fellowship, and service. Mm -hmm. So all those things are what we're giving. Basically, all right, I know you don't know how to lead. I didn't know how to either, but I made a lot of mistakes along the way. I wrote them down. Yeah. We had some successes <laughs> oh. and we've learned from those. So mm -hmm. we'll teach you how to do what you can't do or what you yeah. think you can't do. So pastors yeah. who really know that they need to reach men, mm -hmm. you could come and help them. Yes. But yeah. They've got to be willing to do what is needed. Yeah. They got to get those men together, right? Mm -hmm. They got to. Yeah. Cause without that, it's just going to be yeah. something else. It's, it's yeah. me coming in and giving a talk and leaving right. and nothing changes. Right. 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 And I'm not interested in that. I want yeah. fruit that lasts. Yeah. I, I want to look back in 10 years and, and, and these aren't just a guy in the pew groups. These are literally saying, this is yours to own, yours to grow into whatever. Yeah, you're not going there to kind of own something. You're going there to serve. You're going there right. to strengthen them and leave them with something that can really. Yeah. yeah that's great. It becomes what they want and what they need yeah. for their parents because you've been in a million parishes. They're all different. Yeah. You know, and so it's let it become theirs. There's that ownership. And when you have that ownership, yeah. things last because it's not somebody else's thing I'm doing. It's ours. Right, 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 right. How many parishes are you working in right now? We have started 11 groups since last August. And okay. so now we're, that's really the focus of the ministry. We're trying to go out twice a month mm -hmm. and do a mission on a Friday, Saturday, train the men, come back. Mm -hmm. And then we're building a leader portion of our website where we're going to have eight to 10 minute videos on mm -hmm. practical leadership. Mm -hmm. And then also um, where we're going to have monthly Zoom calls for these leaders to come in together and have a cohort of each other to, yeah. to lean on. Yeah, that's really great. That's really great. <laughs> 
I, I want to put in a word for Angela. Yes, please. You know, I, I met her this past weekend, and um, she's she's an ordinary Catholic woman, but ordinary Catholic women are pretty extraordinary. Yeah, amen. I mean, it's pretty it's pretty wonderful how her and her family kind of um, insisted that you become a Catholic. <laughs> That's right. And then stood by you when yeah. you had trouble, you know. Yeah. And I, I just really want to just say a shout out to Angela. Thank you for that. And thanking Angela and for standing by you and thanking you for responding to the grace of God and the fruit that that's bringing, not just to your own life, but to uh, many other men. Yeah, it's, I'm telling you, I thought having the house, the car, the money, and all those things would make me happy, and they didn't. Yeah. The thing that makes me happy is serving our Lord and, and yeah. being lucky enough to be married to a woman like Angela. Yeah, yeah, that's really great. John, thanks so much for being with us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for traveling up here to the far north of Michigan <laughs> uh, from uh, sunny Memphis. Hey, you're welcome, anytime. Okay, God bless you, yeah. My friend Peter Herbeck's written a booklet called Receiving Fire. And you can see this fire in John, you know, and this fire in the men he's working with. And we all need the fire of the Holy Spirit. We need all the fire of, of love for Jesus Christ. And uh, if anybody out there today is in a situation of darkness or addiction or just kind of hopelessness or discouragement or self-hatred or hatred of God, wherever you are, the Lord wants to give you the grace right now to uh, surrender, to let go, to repent, to throw yourself at the feet of Jesus and say, Lord, I can't do it by myself. I need your help. And, and he will. He will help you. And I'd like to encourage you to go to John's website. What's the website address again? Just a guy on the pew.com. Yeah, just go there and get the help that's available there. And we'd like to make this booklet available to you at no cost just for the asking. Because of the generosity of our donors, we can do that. So call the 800 number or go to our website, renewalministries.net. Click on send me the booklet and we'll send you the booklet. Jesus said, I've come to cast fire on the earth, would that it were already ablaze. The Bible gives us a striking image of Jesus Christ in glory with eyes flaming fire, revealing a heart of burning love between God the Father and God the Son. It's that fire that Jesus wants to give to each and every one of us, a living flame of love and grace for those who receive it, but it's also a fire of judgment for those who refuse it. In this short booklet, I wanna help you understand and to receive the fire Jesus desires to ignite in your heart. To receive a free copy, visit our website or call the number on the screen.